Okay. <laughs> I'm waiting. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. I'm Becky Goldsmith, and welcome to Time Out. Thank you for joining me today on this lovely day in June. It's June <laughs> still. Summer's crazy. Um, so, I'm Becky Goldsmith. You can find me at peaceofcake.com. The quilt behind me is Spring Wheels. And this quilt is from Once Upon a Season, um, which is out of print, but you can get it as either a print-on-demand book or an ebook. But the pattern for this, in the book it's done on foundation papers, but if you look on the website, I've also got a downloadable pattern that is almost exactly like this, and it's done on English papers. So it's English paper piecing. This is a really fun project, whether you do it on the machine or by hand with English paper piecing. All right, so that's what's there. Now, I made a note to myself to tell you, to show you the stash as it is now today. Because remember last week I showed you how I cleaned out my stash? Yeah, it looks pretty good in the closet. Let me show you real quick. I showed you the stash before. I want to show you my stash after the weeding out. There is room for more fabric. <laughs> There's still kind of a giant amount of fabric in the closet, more than I can ever sew in a lifetime. There's nothing on the floor on this side. My piles of fabric in the studio have all been incorporated into the closet. And lastly, my rolling bin is empty. I know myself, I'll buy more fabric but I have room for it now. It's pretty great, isn't it? And I know, I know that compared to some of you, I do have a giant stash. And compared to others of you, I have a drop in the bucket. Um, somewhere in there, you will find your happy spot. And I'm back to a lean, happy stash. It makes me happy. All right, so... What I promised to talk to you about this week is basting, quilt basting. Oh, and I need to click that. All right, so some of this I've mentioned before in Time Out. Uh, a lot of this, if you've ever heard me give my quilting lecture, you've seen some of this. Um, the thing is, I baste a certain way. I'm going to show you what I do. Remember that... Um, you can pick and choose the kinds of things you like to do yourself. So I'm going to show you what I do. Uh, before you baste, you've got to have batting. I have talked to you about batting, but I, you know, wanted to say, if you're getting ready to baste a quilt, make sure you've got your batting in hand. If you missed the time out on batting, it's, it's back a few weeks. It's back a ways, but you can find it. Um, you need needles. If you're me, you need basting needles because I thread baste. You know those little pins, the little safety pins, the curved ones? I hate them with a screaming passion. Really, I, they make my hands hurt. They get in the way. I know people say yes, but they're wonderful for machine quilting because you can't sew over them. Well, yeah, you can't sew over them. You have to stop and take them out. What a hassle, and they're heavy, and they leave holes in the fabric. I would much rather thread-based. Um, you can clip threads as needed when you're uh, quilting, and if you happen to sew over it, it won't kill your machine. You just have to clip it out a little more carefully. So, I like either of these two quilt-basting needles. Really, either one. Oh, I should say, one is Roxanne's, and the other is by Tulip. Some people, I should go back to that. Some people use a long darner, and I used to. Uh, some people use doll-making needles. But really, I just use those basting needles. Okay. Of the people who asked me, who sent me questions and really wanted me to talk about basting, at least one of them said, what do you put on the back? 
I almost always put a busy back on my quilts because it's more interesting to look at when I pull them out. And I myself am not interested in the design of the quilting on the back of the quilt. Maybe if I did something different, I would be interested. You may be interested, but I put uh, busy backs on my quilt and I generally work out of my stash. I have some one yard cuts and I do still have some one yard cuts of fabric and I'll buy more. But when I buy one yard pieces of fabric, it's almost always with the idea in mind that they'll get pieced into a back and I don't go crazy with the piecing. By the time I'm ready to make the back, I just want to get it made. So my backs tend to be not very fancy. All right. Once you get your back, back made, what I do is take it to the dining room table. Steve built this table for us, and it is intentionally finished on the top so that if I nick it with the needle, nobody cares. Uh, so it's pine. That's um, It's a really nice pine. So it's pine flooring from a hanger at an old hanger that got taken down at Dallas Love Field. So this is two by six flooring that's tongue and groove that's on the top of the table. The planks run lengthwise down the table and there is a center seam. So I take my quilt back to the table and I have marked with a pin the center of the top and the bottom and I line those up with the center seam in the table like that. I tape the back to the table top. I don't stretch it. Let me go back one. I'm not pulling it tight to stretch it. I'm just making it flat so that it's not going to shift around. I use painter's tape for this. I have in the past tried packing tape. It is a really bad idea to use packing tape because it can pull the finish off your table. So I mark the center top and bottom and I get it lined up along the, um, along the center. And my quilt back is right side down, wrong side up on the table. Then I take my batting and I open it up. I take it out of the bag because I typically have bagged batting. I open it up and I cut the batting even with the raw edges of the quilt back. Now the quilt back is bigger than the quilt top by however much. Usually I have two to four inches out there because I'm thread basting by hand. I'm not doing this on a long arm. I'm not sending the quilt to a long armor. This is what I'm, this is how I baste when I'm basting for me. <clears throat> then you open up the rolled batting and you know how if you open up rolled batting, you get that business. You get um, stretches and wrinkles and that sort of thing. Never take your hands on top of the bat and smooth it out. Bad, bad idea. It stretches the bat. So you get on the side of it and you sort of fluff it up and down and you make it airy and you pat out. I'm trying to get in front of the wrinkles. I'm sorry, in front of the camera. You just pat out wrinkles. You don't stretch them out. So there, it's getting more and more level where it's still a little wrinkly. I just pat the wrinkles down and they flatten out reasonably well. Then, I'm hitting go forward, then where it's uh, big over the sides of the table, I cut off the excess batting again, even with the quilt back. Then I open up my quilt top and spread it right side up over the batting, centered, because I've still got that center plank in the wood, so I, I can eyeball center. Now, of course, before I lay my quilt down, I have checked the back of it for stray dark threads. And at this point, I can still, I, I look close through the light fabric to see if there's anything that's shadowing through. 
And if there is, I peel it back and I deal with that before I lay the quilt top back down. And then I call Steve. <laughs> Sometimes he's not there. Sometimes I haven't booked him in advance. But when I'm lucky, I call Steve and he will come in and do my thread basting for me because he loves me. And I love him. It's really nice. He's, he's a really good thread baster. And if he's not around, if I, you know, if he's busy, then I will do this task myself. So he threads up or I thread up one of the basting needles and a light colored thread, typically a 30 or 40 weight thread. I have been known to baste with hand quilting thread, but in all cases, I do my best to choose a light thread, especially if I'm working on a dark quilt, because if, I mean, I'm sorry, if I'm working on a light quilt, because if you've got dark thread and you pull it through light fabric, Sometimes there can be excess dye in the thread that can be left on those little holes. It wouldn't be much, but why, why take the risk? Just use a white thread or light thread. All right, so what he did there, let me go back. So he base from right to left because he's right-handed, same, same with me, from one side of the quilt, one edge. So as he's sitting there facing the quilt, he would have started at the right-hand border, the border kind of closest to us that you see left on the bottom of the screen. He started there, goes across the quilt to the far side um, and does a little back stitch, cuts the thread, leaves a tail. And at the beginning end, he has a big knot in the thread, but never pull that knot too close to the quilt top because it's too easy to gather it up. So you pull it down and then leave some slack between the knot and the quilt top. I wash my fabric in the washer, dry it in the dryer. I'm using cotton batting. Once I layer these layers together, they are not going to go anywhere. They're not going to move. So starting in the center and working out to base is not something I've ever found I needed to do. If I had a real, if I was using silk on something that was slick, I don't know what that would be. Maybe, maybe you would need to start from the center out. But again, I've never needed to. All right, so he works on one side of the table as far as he can reach and gets right to left. He shifts to the chair on the other side, does the same thing on the other side, and then he has to shift the quilt to get right to left what was hanging off the edge of the table. And when you do that, the top of the quilt is going to have a little hump in it because the quilt top travels a farther distance over the drop edge of the table than does the quilt back or the batting. So when you do that, when you shift the quilt, peel the back back, peel the batting back, and then carefully lay the batting down, pat it in place, and then lay the quilt top down over it, just like that. And then continue basting. Um, from right to left on this side of the of the quilt and then he'd do the same thing on the other side but this is the biggest trick i've ever learned when it comes to basting and i learned this in my beginning quilting class from jeanette metz way 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 back in the day so what i do is this or what steve does is run a line of basting stitches right close to the edge of the quilt top, really close. So when you add your binding and you sew it down with a quarter inch seam allowance, ideally these line of, this line of stitches will be covered. So it's inside that quarter of an inch. And then I trim away the batting, leaving about an inch let's say an inch of batting. And then I trim away the backing, 
leaving yet another inch of fabric. Whoop. Fold the excess backing over the exposed edge of the batting. And you can see there that the raw edges of the back are folded over and meet or nearly meet the raw edge of the quilt top. What this does is a lot of things. You know, if you don't do this and you're carrying around this quilt and you're moving it around and it, you know, even if you're machine quilting it on a table, the, um, the raw edge, it can stretch, it frays, it's, it leaves lint everywhere. And it's, it's heavy and it's in the way and it's, it, you know, you may not think it's in the way <laughs> until you make it go away and then you realize, yeah, that was kind of in the way. So um, basting this down gives you a much nicer edge to the quilt while you're doing your quilting. So every time we get to an edge, he or I, we finish that edge in that manner. When all of the quilt top is done in one direction, you rotate it and do the same thing in the other direction. But this time, you don't have to worry so much about where the edge of the quilt drops over the table because that has been basted in place. You, don't, you couldn't, because it's basted, peel that up and um, flatten it back out. All right, how far apart is your basting grid? something like six inches. It, for me, is dependent on the pattern of the quilt that I'm basting. So you'll notice there, I'm not basting directly in the ditch. I'm basting just a little bit off the ditch. So I want to hold it in place, but I don't want to I don't want it in the way where I'm got where I know I'm going to place a lot of stitches or a line of stitches. I don't do diagonal basting. I've never found that to be necessary. Seems like kind of a lot of overkill. You could do it if you wanted to. Uh, what else don't I do? I don't typically baste more than this. Again, I haven't found that I needed to. You could, if you wanted to, you could baste much closer together. Okay, now, this is the next trick, because let's say you get the whole thing basted. I've given you all the basting <laughs> tricks right there. Um, this is the next trick, and it's, it's another one that I learned from Jeanette. When you trim away the excess backing and batting after your quilting is complete, leave about a quarter of an inch. You can leave more, but a quarter of an inch is about right of excess batting and backing beyond the edge of the quilt top. And especially for those of you who have binding that you put it on and it's it never is quite full at the edge, what this does is fill your binding all the way out. I always do this. Okay, when you trim, you just trim off all the all this stuff, right? And, and you just throw that away. So you trim away leaving a quarter of an inch and then you make your binding whether it is straight or bias. It's really nice even if it's straight binding if you have that 45 degree cut at the beginning end of your binding. Press about a half an inch seam allowance. Just, just press a hem over in that angled end and pin the binding <clears throat> to the first side of your quilt, starting somewhere in the middle, somewhere kind of like either closer to the corner. I typically start below center a little, a little farther down the quilt, so not almost to the end where I'm going to turn the corner, but closer to where I'll meet it when I come back. Pin that in place. And don't sew down. I'm going to go back one. It takes a minute. So the, I've got the two pins on the diagonal there by the opening of the binding. And then you see a pin that's almost vertical, perpendicular to the edge. 
that's where I would start sewing the binding down. All right, when you sew your binding to the quilt, use a walking foot. Always use a walking foot. And it's the same reason why you would use a walking foot for machine quilting. It's because there's so many layers there. If you don't use a walking foot, the pressure of the presser foot on that top layer against the action of the feed dogs pulling the opposite way will slide your layers apart and it can cause you to have little funky ripples on the edge of your quilt. You don't want that. So use a walking foot and you measure the quarter of an inch to sew your binding on from the edge of the quilt top. And notice there, notice here, and let me go back one, notice that the raw edges of the binding are not way out there at the edge of the backing and batting. They are where they should be at the edge of the quilt top. All right. So we've lined it up, we've pinned it down, you're sewing with your walking foot. And you know, you do the thing at the corner where you sew to the corner, stay a quarter of an inch inside of the point, back stitch, turn the corner, fold the binding up, fold the binding down, start again. Or you do whatever it is you do at a corner. But this is the cool part. When you get back to the beginning, the way you end the binding is this. You trim off the excess binding that's left, leaving about a half an inch more than you need for that to fit inside of the V at the beginning. So you take the pin on the right that you see there, the angled pin on the right out, open the V up, and slide that newly cut end of the binding into that space. And I usually use the point of my scissors and reach down inside the, um, the end you're fitting in. I reach down inside the fold and sort of move that neatly down into place. Then you reposition the angled cut, the pressed in angled cut of where you started the binding. Pin everything in place, put your walking foot on, and just sew that down. What this eliminates is all the, all the gymnastics we go through to cut both ends and cut them at an angle and make sure everything fits, and make sure you left just the perfect amount of seam allowance. Yes, I can do that. I don't like doing it. <laughs> this is so much easier. And I got to tell you, you will never find this. You have to look hard on any of the quilts I've done this on, and that's nearly every quilt I've ever made. Now, what? and, and I want to go back here. So, do I want to go back here? Yeah, I want to go back here. So, you're thinking to yourself, yeah, yeah, yeah. But when I turn this over, that seam won't be sewn down. You know when you're stitching your binding to the back of the quilt, you whip stitch that angled opening in. And Lorna says there's a question, the width of the binding. Well then, depends how wide you want your binding to be. I almost always cut my binding two and a half inches, almost always. And um, then it's folded. If I want my binding to make more of a visual statement, I would cut my binding wider and I would leave more than a quarter inch of the backing and batting. If I wanted my binding to be much smaller so that it's not as much of a design statement, then I might cut my strips at two and a quarter, maybe. And if I did that, I might not be able to leave as much backing and batting as you see there. The thing about the excess backing and batting, you can always trim off more. You, it's really hard to add it <laughs> if you cut off too much. So err on the side of, of leaving more because you can. Now to turn the corners making, um, to turn the corners when you've left this extra backing and batting, you do want to trim away that dog ear 
of excess backing and batting at the corner before you turn your corners. And I use Wonder Clips to fold the binding to the back. Uh, and I'm careful. You'll notice there, if you look, if you look on the, on the right side where the Wonder Clips are in place, you can't see the straight line of stitching where the binding has been sewn to the quilt. If you look along the top of the top picture, you can see the basting stitch that Steve did that's you know very near the raw edge of the quilt top. You can see the line of white stitches, the straight line where the binding was sewn to the quilt. When that binding folds around to the back, it just takes that extra backing and batting with it. So it's just, just like this. It just curls under along with the batting. And then there to get the mitered corner, you just, you just play with it to make it, to make it be what you want it to be. All right. So, oh, and when you're hand sewing your binding, I do whip stitch those angled, uh, angled corner seams. I don't leave them loose. And I do, well, okay, when I say I sew my binding down to the back by hand. Very often that's Steve doing that. He's, he's good at that part too. Um, it's the only sewing he does and I do have to ask him in advance to do it. But if he has time, he's really good at it and um, I, I very much appreciate him doing that part. I have tried in the past sewing the binding, you know, finishing it on the machine. I just don't like the way it looks. I, I like, I just don't, I just don't like the way it looks. So by hand is always the way I would go. People have asked me what kind of fusible batting they should use. I wouldn't use any of them myself, so I have no idea. Um, same thing with spray, you know, and the fusing and the chemicals and the. I'm 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 not the person that's going to ever love that, and. And so, some of you may really love it, and you may have you may want to leave comments to say, "Oh yes, fusible web. This particular fusible web is really great," and if you do that, also include why, how densely you're quilting specifically what bad it is, how thick it is, are you quilting it on the machine, are you quilting it by hand, all of these things go into those kinds of choices. I tend to keep it low key, just the fabric, just the batting, just the thread. Ah, uh, look at that. I've used up another almost a half hour. So, you've got my email. Please do email me if you have questions or topics you'd like me to address. We leave next Wednesday, so I won't be live on Wednesday. I'll be in a car. Um, we come back after the following Wednesday. If I can pull it together to record something, I will, and we'll post that. And if not, in the newsletter and on our website, I will suggest certain excellent timeouts that you might want to revisit. So I might see you next week or the week after. I will for sure see you the week after that. So until then, it might be next Wednesday, might not, somewhere in there, like I just said. I look forward to seeing you again once vacation is over. And until then, may you have many happy stitches. Thanks for watching.